ice breaker session where we met very briefly for maybe 30 minutes or so we got acquainted with one another and uh, you also got acquainted got introduced to sogat sir who would be taking care of the rest of the classes during the introductory session uh, we had a feeling that uh, it's very important that uh, we try to engage you uh, by providing an overview and overall picture and in that context professor joyce sen professor uh, Dep department of architecture and regional planning uh, and uh, chairman of neuro museum and chairman of uh, new new center of excellence for indian traditional knowledge systems uh, who has uh, a wonderful and extremely i would say a uh, talented uh, background in visual arts music iconography and a number of areas would kind of introduce the theme of uh, this discussion uh, that is to follow uh, in the first 15 to 20 minutes so over to professor joyce sen who is very fondly known by many of us uh, uh, as, as joyda and uh, many of the younger generation uh, of students uh, his beloved to many of the younger generation students will be starting this session so over to joy sir yeah i'll just share uh, with the permission of professor uh, patnaik and uh, the instructor carrier of this course uh, uh, artist a uh, scholar mr pinaki gain i'll just share a small ppt with you pinaki is this visible yeah yes sir yes sir it is visible pinaki have okay. you started recording just a just a moment joy yeah yes, yeah i'm just speaking okay sure pinaki have you started recording yes sir yes sir okay excellent thank you so i think a uh, uh, very good morning to all of you and i'm sure there had been an introductory uh, session and uh, all of you are a part of a fraternity which is iit kharagpur which is the oldest and the mother of the iit system so it is a feature that uh, and it is an expectation that the indian institute of technology kharagpur will do something which will uh, transcend the limited borders of the understanding of science and technology and it will embrace incorporate and assimilate some of the inputs which will make a human being a complete human being so that he is just he or she is just not a man or an omen of the machine but he or she is also a man and omen of the society and the freedom that we have in our life so to do that uh, over a period of last 6 7 years professor patnaik especially professor pallab das gupta who is a forerunner of this academy professor anandarup bhattacharya professor arnob rai and many others including dr arnob hajra of the nehru museum of science and technology and someone like pinaki da i mean if i am joy da uh, pinaki da is also pinaki da to you and uh, and of course we have a very talented person amid us i mean through whom we have been exposed to the wonders of indian art that is professor shobhata dash who will be taking who will be the main carrier of this course so as i was telling you uh, i'll be very short about 5 to 10 minutes i'll just share four or five slides only with you to give you an overview and try and answer only partly answer that why we have this indian traditional and contemporary art i mean why are we having art to begin with and why are we covering traditional art to begin with again and why are we then landing up with contemporary art to end with and then with all of that where are we heading to i mean what is our final goal and all the objectives under it so i have about four or five slides that i'm sure there has been some uh, very uh, full running and brilliant lectures from professor das gupta and others there has been a good history of this academy of the classical and folk arts which has evolved from the background of other such organizations evolving you know the initial movement of the science and heritage initiative which is sandhi and then uh, a center of happiness which professor patnaik heads and he for runs which is an indicator of the freedom which has come to this campus 
And then of late, we have a new center of excellence for the Indian knowledge systems, where one of the principal domain, of course, in theory and research, because in this academy, we are, will, be, will be mostly practicing and performing and displaying and drawing, whereas in the center, we'll be doing some deep research. So the center and the academy are going to be complementary, hopefully in the days and the years to come. So this is a very exciting moment at IIT Kharagpur, though we have a slightly uh, trembling moment in the background because of the health situation. But uh, every dark age, every medieval age, every trough in the history of civilization is always succeeded by a resurrection, by a renaissance, you know, by a resurgence of new and wonderful ideas. So the, so the expression of that renaissance is actually a triangle. It's actually a triangle. It's actually a triangle which uh, which I'm trying to share with you. And this triangle is actually very, very important because it's forwarded by one of the greatest uh, uh, psychologists of the modern times, post Freudian, uh, uh, Professor Abraham Maslow. And this is known as Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I'm sure many of you have already seen this. For some of you who has not seen this, this actually represents the urge of the human civilization and uh, to move on and on to higher and higher levels of understanding. And believe it or not, each level has a corresponding level of art. You know, when we are at the mundane physical level, uh, the level of subsistence and survival and existence with our basics, you know, biological and physical, then art is essentially biological and physical. You know, most of the art that we have in our newspapers, most of the art that we have in the grounded media is always at the physical, physiological level. And it's very mundane. And a lot of people actually prefer that. You know, that's what Professor Patnaik is going to talk about. Like your art may not be my art. My art may not be your art. But somewhere Maslow has configured a wonderful hierarchy which embraces all the gradations and the levels of art. So though we have a material beginning of art, but finally art enters an area where somebody offers you safety, security, health and property. You know, for example, if you go to a hospital or a health clinic or an education center, I mean, you'll find a lot of art which is associated with uh, health systems, you know, various signages, iconography. It's very important in the world of today a lot of things to do with uh, education, to inspire the young generations, various icons. So they're all connected with that. But art does not stop there. It goes even higher and it comes to the level of meeting the grandfather. It comes to the level of meeting the grandfather to the next door, probably have an art competition or an art gathering or an art fair at your neighborhood level. That's where art becomes love and belonging. I mean, you have art of friendship, art which depicts family ties, art which uh, depicts intimacy, connections between people and people, between society and society. And a lot of art that we see in India, whether it's Buddhist art or Hindu art or Christian art or Islamic art or, or scientific art is actually from this level where different societies have actually portrayed art. You know. But art again does not stop there, it moves even higher and goes to the level of esteem, you know, it goes to the level of respect, status, recognition, and art becomes an expression of freedom, you know, for example, the art of Michelangelo, the art of Ravi Verma or Rabindranath Tagore, you know, these are arts which has changed the society and it has not only given a lot of strength to the society, but it has given freedom, it has given new direction, a leap change, and it becomes a huge uh, changing catalyst or a media for the whole society itself. But again, but again, art does not stop there. And this is where Indian art is very unique compared to other forms or, of global art. Much beyond the physical, the social, the moral and the cultural, India also presents spiritual art, which is just not religious because religion means uh, organized institutions. But spirituality is the connection between you your own self and the self of the universe. You know. So that is where art reaches the highest point in the, the arts of Tagore, the art of Aurobindo, 
the art of uh, Vincent van Gogh, you know, the art of Leonardo Vinci, for example, they belong to that level, you know, that pan universal altruistic level. So their art becomes self actualization. So you see uh, uh, Indian art has all these uh, five levels. It has all these five levels and in that sense it has it has it has sustained in the history of human civilization you know the very ancient indian art is also the very mo modern art for example in architecture we have the various icons which are probably 5000 years old in the indus valley civilization and they are even repeated today you know like the swastika for example even even today the swastika is a very important symbol and we use it for various purposes just not religion or spirituality, even for science. You know, if you come, if you combine two torts, it becomes a swastika. So there are a lot of expressions uh, and that makes Indian art very holistic. So this is what you can call the external ladder of art. But if you go to the fifth level, the highest level, Indian art uh, reaches a very rich level. And this is something which is not so easy to understand because to understand this, uh, we have to be developed as developed as the art which is produced by the individual and the kind of development that he has. So if I have to understand uh, the art inside an Ajanta cave, if I have to understand the art inside a Sistine Chapel, you know, the father and the son by Michelangelo, then I have to understand the life and the living of Michelangelo and all the artists who has drawn those paintings in the caves. You know. If I don't understand, then the interpretation will be mine. It won't be the, it won't be the interpretation or the feeling with which that artist whose name you don't find, you know, like today, today anything that we do, we have a website and we preach for ourselves. But in the ancient time, everything was very, everything was very calm. Everything was very sober. You know, people were more civilized. You know, people had a lot of restraint. So India had produced a great laboratory, which is called the inner laboratory of art. So these kind of arts used to come out, used to come out from the inner feelings, from the inner realization, more than feelings, and from the inner world of meditation. And people used to describe these inner forms of art into the external form. So much of traditional Indian art belongs to the internal laboratory, unlike the external laboratory of modern art that we have today. So to understand art, especially Indian traditional and contemporary art, you have to understand both the extremes. And this is not possible in a single class. This is neither possible in five or 25 classes. This is a lifelong prachishta. This is a lifelong endeavor. You know, this is a lifelong earnest aspiration to be an artist. You know, the Upanishads say, you know, thou art that, you know. So, I mean, you are that. I mean, you, I mean, for example, uh, Professor Patnaik is that, which is the supreme being. So to become that is a piece of art. I mean, the Upanishads say, tatvam vasi, which is thou art that. So the word art is as old as the Upanishads, you know. You know, thou art that. So it means the equivalence of the individual, the microcosm, and the universal, the macrocosm, is art. Is art itself. So art is just not a feeling, is not, is just not sitting down for some time and doing something which you are wishing to do for the sake of it. But it's it's absolutely a science of feelings. And to give it an expression which is from nature with the seven colors of Vibgyo and the seven rhythms of music. So art has a very strong scientific background and I'm sure with uh, Shobhata sir and with Professor Patnaik's uh, very strong guidance and with uh, one of the wonderful artists that I have known in my life, Pinakida, you'll be going through a wonderful journey in this course and you'll be becoming a slightly better human being from what you are. The whole purpose of this course is to make you happy, is to make you aware of the Indian knowledge system, is to make you an Indian and also a global citizen at the same time so that you can relate your internal and external world. So with this 
this argument actually happened during Renaissance, when Raphael, one of the Renaissance artists, had shown the school of Athens, and he showed the debate between the guru and the shishya, you know, between Plato and Aristotle. And Aristotle is the father of the aristocratic, Aristot, you know, the aristocratic society, you know, that we have today. You know, the society which believes in consumerism, a lot of products, profit, materialism, you know, the kind of society that we have. But Plato said to Aristotle that if you just have that, if you just have the material and the grounding of art only, then it will be destroyed. Civilization will be destroyed. Greece will be destroyed. You must have a higher connection. You must have a larger connection. You must have a universal connection. So this debate between Plato, Plato said, I am not disregarding what you are saying, but, but material art cannot be just for material art. It has to aim for the moral, the ethical, the cultural, and finally the universal, which is the spiritual. So this is this is from the school of Athens, the, the famous dialogue uh, painted by one of the greatest artists, Raphael, uh, which is known as the school of Athens. So remember this. So Plato, uh, Pythagoras agreed with Plato and Alexander agreed with Aristotle. So these are the two sides of Greece. And I think you all know that Greece finally got destroyed. You know, today what we know of Greece is all history, but India did not get destroyed. Why? Because India continued with the universal plane. It is a universal and the spiritual plane which saved India. This is these are the words of uh, second uh, Indian president, Dr. Sharvapali Radhakrishnan. He said India got saved because it reached the highest level of human civilization, which is spirituality. Whereas the other civilizations have come and they have gone. They have not been able to reach the highest form of art. So these are the words of Dr. Sarvapali Radhakrishnan, who came to IIT Kharagpur for a second convocation. And you can Google surf his lecture and you can listen to him and you can feel what is actually embedded in this wonderful work by Raphael. So I'm almost coming to the end of this. And I think this is perhaps my last slide. So this is what is very important. So you have to combine the contemporary and the traditional uh, sides of art. So this is a regression equation where x is a uh, in, independent variable and y is a dependent variable and if you look at the blue line i mean every value of x determines every value of y so it starts with a zero but it never has a very high growth which the other curve has you know it has an intercept which is a and the value of y which is a is is independent of the value of x. That means x, y has a value even before x started giving its value in the present time. So this intercept is the past. This intercept is the heritage. This intercept is the tradition. This is the beginning of art. If you don't have that, they don't, then you don't have a higher slope, a higher objective, and a higher run of civilization. So the total definition of art is equal to A plus BX. That means it's a combination of past and future. So with this regression equation of science, we have shown this to our IK students and they're very excited. And there's already a research paper which is happening. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, there's a lot more behind, behind this. So one day in the future, if I get a chance, I'll show you more and more logical and empirical evidences to prove scientifically that why you need heritage and tradition with technology and modernization. So it is just not modernization which is impacting the society to produce one kind of art, but it is also tradition which is impacting technology to, to, to produce the other kind of art. So these are the two sides of art that you need to combine. And this is expressed in the goal number 11 of the sustainability development goals of the United Nations because, uh, you know, for example, we are planners and architects, so I know a little bit about it. So we have walked a little bit under this. So this is what the United Nations talks about in the modern times and what the United Nations talks about in the modern times was spoken by the Indian philosophers and more than the philosophers, the sages, the rishis of India thousands and thousands of years ago, of which 
Buddha was one of the last sage of that ancient age, you know. So he he is one person who had actually, in addition to monastery, he has also he had also founded, you know, uh, schools and monasteries of liberal arts, performing arts, and fine arts. That's why there was an explosion of art and and culture during his time, which happened in the ancient time also. But that's very remote history. So with this background. I welcome you on behalf of Professor Patnaik and particularly Professor Pallav Dasgupta and the wonderful team that he has created for this Academy of Classical and Folk Arts, which is just a beginning, a tip of the iceberg, which one day will become a huge academy and it will fulfill the dreams of some of the founders of, of IIT Kharagpur, which was Lady Ranu Mukherjee of the Academy of Fine Arts, who almost 70 years back had said, she has said that if IIT Kharagpur wants to grow as a great institution, then it should combine science and technology with art. I am sure she is immortal and she's listening to this class and I'm sure her soul is very happy today because today the Academy of Classical and Folk Arts have exactly done what she wished about 70 years back. So this is absolutely fantastic. And with this and with this, I, I, I sort of end. I, I sort of end uh, my presentation and uh, let me also uh, let me also let me also uh, uh, welcome all of you to this wonderful course where Pinakida is going to take you. And I, I think after me, Professor Patnaik will have a very strong, uh, more detailed more granulated lecture to give you what's going to happen in the next few weeks and the next two or three months. So I, I welcome all of you to uh, to IIT Kharagpur and to this Academy of uh, Classical and Fine Arts. And you have a wonderful person like Professor Patnaik. Uh, and I take this occasion to talk about his mother. I was very close to her and she was one of the patrons of Indian classical art, and I'm sure in today's class there is a blessing. There is a blessing from Mashima because almost every fortnight I just remember her uh, once. Uh, Priya, I'm very emotional about her, uh, but I, I I pray for her blessings to wish this class a wonderful beginning. So thank you so much for giving me this starting opportunity. Thank you. I hope I was audible. Yes, yes absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sen, uh, for a beautiful beginning, very insightful, very reflective and philosophy. So we will take this forward uh, with uh, some practical applications uh, and a quick overview of the things that are going to be covered, as rightly pointed out by Professor Sen. So uh, with everybody's permission, I'll just uh, share my slides and initiate the discussion. So I hope that uh, the presentation is visible. Yes, sir. OK, yeah, thank it's, you. It's, it's, it's visible. It's visible. It's thank, visible. thank you very much. So these are the things uh, that we would be touching uh, upon in the next uh, 30 to 35 minutes, uh, because uh, I believe that I might slightly overstep the boundaries. Yeah. By so can, you, can you just show the first slide once more? I'll just keep a print screen image of this. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, what we will do is uh, uh, we will take roughly for uh, we have 30 minutes with us, but we will take maybe another five, seven minutes more to kind of give it a save. So please bear with the additional seven to 10 minutes that might, we might take for this class. So at the outset, we will ask some very basic questions. What is visual art? Then we'll look at examples and illustrations. Then we will talk about the materials and mediums which are used. So that will kind of ground many of you who may or may not be aware of the different ways that art is done to the specific area. And uh, we will focus on some interesting observations about art and some very interesting debates related to art in general. And uh, we will begin this journey uh, with 
a few examples and illustrations of this. So, so what we are going to focus on right now is these are two textbook definitions of visual arts. So creative art, which uh, where, whose products are appreciated by sites such as painting, sculpture, filmmaking, as contrasted with literature and music, where the visual component is not highlighted. This is a dictionary definition. The second one that you see over here focuses on art forms, indicating painting, drawing, printmaking, sculpture, ceramics, photography, videos, filmmaking, design, craft, architecture, even moving into areas like uh, art, uh, conceptual art, performing, performing arts, textiles, and so many other things. Friends, this is from the Wikipedia. If you're looking at these two textbook definitions, the fundamental question is that we need to identify what exactly we are talking about. When we talk about colors, it is no use just saying that uh, color is like this, color is like that, color is red, color is like this, and all kinds of dis dis uh, discussions, descriptions would not suffice until we get uh, a concrete example of a few, exam few illustrations of red. And then we are able to know what is red and are able to differentiate the red from other colors. In a very similar way, you see that all these ideas related to creativity, visuals, uh, doing things with lines, colors, is fine uh, for a beginning definition. But probably a good way of looking at visual arts is actually to dive into it and have a glimpse of some of the examples. So friends, what I'm going to take you through and as I'm going to take you through, I will be mostly concentrating on Indian art forms, Indian artists per se, and uh, things related to that. We will get a glimpse of different varieties of uh, art forms, different kinds of artists, and the different mediums uh, which are used for doing art. Here are a few examples with which we begin. For instance, uh, what I'm doing is that I'm introducing you to different um, mediums and different artists who work with them. Friends, we talk about landscape, we talk about portraits, we talk about figures. If you're looking at the three images over here, all these are figured, uh, I'm kind of covered through these examples. If you're looking at the first one, which is a pale and ink by Vincent van Gogh, then what you're looking at is some compositions which have been drawn, okay? So drawing is a very, very significant part of uh, uh, visual arts. Very often it is at the basic level, it is the underlayer of many paintings, but then drawing independent of being an underlayer of paintings on canvases or watercolors in itself is a very, very powerful medium and tool. And it has its unique expressibility. And even here, there are so many variations. And for example, if you're looking at the uh, sketch by Van Gogh, these are made using what are known as reed paints. A reed paint, reed is a very uh, thin uh, stalk with a hole inside. So you use a uh, sharp knife to cut it angularly and then make a slice, make a kind of a mark in it, and then you dip it in any kind of ink and then you start drawing on it. So this is a sepia toned ink that you see over here and that has been used for these drawings. The lines are uneven, but they have a fascinating energy about them. If you're looking at the second image, which is an etching, then interestingly in an etching, what happens is that the drawing is a very, very tough uh, work because on a metal uh, seat plated with wax, you start using a stylus, a metal stylus or a metal nib, and then you start drawing and no corrections can be made. Once this drawing has been made on the wax, which you can barely see properly. Then you put it inside an acid bath, and then you see that the metal is corroded because that is the area which is exposed when you have scratched out your drawing. And later on, you use specific printmaking techniques to transfer the drawing onto paper. So what I'm doing right now, friends, is talking about different mediums and how they work. Pencils you are well aware of, and here I'm sharing with you a very uh, beautiful uh, pencil drawing by a very eminent Indian artist, Nandalal Bose, who belongs to the Santini Ketan School of Art, uh, very strongly influenced by Ravindranath Tagore. And at some point of time, I'm sure that Joyce will take a special session, uh, which will focus on the 
Bengal School of Art and uh, the uh, the various kinds of influences Tagore had on very very important uh, uh, international uh, painters, including Japanese painters. If you're looking at other mediums, we have other mediums. For instance, oil. Oil painting is made when you ground dry pigments. These are minerals taken from different parts of the earth. Sometimes you can even make your own mineral uh, uh, pigment colors using either uh, vegetables or uh, like haldi, that is turmeric, like, like neem, neem, that is uh, blue, indigo. And uh, you can mix it with different kinds of additives or that which is a sticky substance. So in an oil paint, the dry pigment is mixed with oil and then you paint with it, generally on boards or on canvases. Here is a beautiful example of uh, oil painting by M.F. Hussain. And this has a strong traditional orientation or Indic orientation because it is about Mother Teresa. So he has a Teresa series. And if you're looking at this, this in is indicative of Mother Teresa. So beautifully depicting the various things that Mother Teresa does without ever showing, uh, revealing her face. But the various kinds of activities Mother Teresa and her people do is the theme of this painting. If you're looking at the other one, uh, just below that, that is by another uh, uh, West Bengal artist, Jogin Choudhury. And what you see here is an ink drawing as well as painting. Ink is a very, colored ink is a very, very powerful medium, uh, which can be used with brushes, it can be also used uh, with graphic paints, uh, with quick, uh, paints and nibs, and you can draw using that. So here is an example by a very eminent uh, contemporary leaving Indian artist, Jogan Choudhury. Tempera is a different medium. I'm, I'm sure that uh, you all have, uh, during your history lessons, been taught about uh, Ajanta, Ellora, and frescoes and temperas over there. Many of them are frescoes, but in reality, many of them are actually fresco soco or temperas. Tempera painting is where you see that uh, you mix the color with something like egg, egg, uh, egg yolk, that is the binder, which the pigment is uh, controlled by that and it gives a glazing effect to that. Tempera also uses gum arabic, okay? Gond, we, we, in India we call it gond, okay? And uh, it all goes from India, but later on because it goes through the Persia, it is known as Arabian gum, that is gum Arabic. So with gaunt as a mixture, uh, you do, but generally with colors which are not transparent, opaque colors, you do tempera. So here is a very beautiful work of art by Ganesh Pine, again, a very, very important Indian artist. I have tried to concentrate on Indian uh, artists using the various mediums for two different reasons. One is to indicate that Indian artists have explored widely a wide range of mediums. And the other one is to look at how Indian artists uh, visualized different contexts and conditions. So you can see here uh, something which relates to the tantric ritual and uh, related to that. The next one you can see on the right hand side is by Avanindranath Thakur Aram, the younger brother of uh, Gurudev uh, uh, Rabindranath Tagore who was a wonderful painter of the Santriketan school. And here is an example of what is known as watercolor. The difference between gauge or temper and watercolor is that in watercolor, the use of the medium is transparent. So you build up layers instead of using it in an opaque way of, of, by mixing it with a filler or some other substance, which gives it lack of transparency, which happens with temper. When it comes to watercolor, the mixture is, uh, the pigment is either is very often used uh, combined with gum arabic again, which gives it a translucent uh, binding effect, as well as with other things like ox gall, okay, that is an extract from the gallbladder of the ox in the European countries, also with honey. Honey is also used as a binder. Sometimes glycerin is also used as a binder. The, the brilliant, the quality of uh, 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 Watercolor is that it is transparent and it's built up in layers. So you keep on putting layers after layers. And these are also known as wash techniques or wash painting. So uh, Avanendranath Ji was a master of that particular tradition. Yes, sir. Yes, sir.
probably Rabindranath Tagore was not Rabindranath Tagore's younger brother. I'm sorry, sorry. Please uh, correct me. I, I'm extremely sorry about that. He belonged to the same family. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but was a relative of uh, Tagore. I'm sorry about that. Rabindranath Tagore probably was Abhinath, uh, uncle. Nef yes, nephew, I believe. Avanindranath was probably the nephew. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, he was a nephew. That's right. He was a nephew, right. Right. I'm extremely sorry, friends. Now we'll move on to some other uh, eminent artists and art forms. This is known as serigraph. Serigraph is a form where uh, where ink, uh, ink screen printing is used. So the mechanism is that uh, you put a kind of a self uh, drawer like kind of kind of thing and you stretch a screen on top of that. Part of the screen is blocked. Part of the screen is open and it's like a photographic technique in that sense but the ink is pressed through that particular layer and depending on how much of blockage is there the ink would penetrate to the lower layer which is the paper so you use a rubber squeezer to squeeze the uh, you put the drawer on top of uh, the paint paper and then you squeeze so that the ink gets transferred to the lower layers now here is a seriograph or a, also known as silk screen printing by akbar padamsi who he specializes in uh, abstract landscapes and see the fine details of colors. At a later point of time, we will talk about the fact that not pa all painting ne need to be necessarily figurative. We can have non-figurative paintings or paintings which do not represent anything of the outside world, but paintings which in themselves, because of the relationship of the various compositional components, are beautiful. So you can just have, like our ornamental designs, they are beautiful just because they are designs. In the same way, some paintings, because of the use of the colors, can be beautiful just because they are put together in a particular way. But this is a very interesting technique. Uh, it is. We also have another technique which is known as lithograph. At a later point of time, sometimes uh, we will talk about it. And you see that uh, the calendar art, which was which was extremely popularized, uh, came to uh, be uh, popularized during the British period of time by a very well-known painter known as Ravi Verma. And the interesting thing is that Ravi Verma took, borrowed from the tradition of uh, naturalistic drawing of the Western tradition. And he also used uh, Indian themes. So you have Sakuntala, you have uh, uh, Saraswati ji, you have uh, Goddess Lakshmi and all that. And uh, the lithography is a technique where on a stone, you see that you draw on wax and then you treat it with uh, a certain mild acid so that it operates on the principle of soap and water or oil and water not mixing up together. What happens is that once this stone is ready with your drawing and it's treated, if you, you roll a, a wet uh, roller, a wet uh, water roller on top of it, and then you wet, uh, roll a roller of ink on top of it, then what happens is that the area which has absorbed water doesn't absorb ink. And then, so, the other area you start printing and for each color you print differently and these colors are overlaid one over the other so you have multiple impressions the same also happens when we are talking about silk screen printing or serigraph you have photography also which is a kind of art form we talked about and here is an example of a photograph by Raghurai who deals with distinctively indian themes and the reason for picking up this photograph is because you see that two different artists using two different mediums explored Mother Teresa. Raghurai also did a beautiful series of uh, photographs on Mother Teresa. And then, of course, as you know, a little earlier I told you that M.F. Hussain also did a series on Mother Teresa. Same person, very radically different approaches and contemporary Indian explorations, I would say. We also have something which is known as mixed media. What is mixed media? Mixed media is like Khichdi. You have rice there, you have dal there, you have sabji, they are all mixed up together. In the same way, you might use oil painting, you might use watercolor, you might use pastels, you might use pencils, all in the same place. Now that's known as a mixed media. And here is an example by another very well-known uh, painter from Bengal, Vikas Bhattachari, who works with a kind of a Indian surrealistic uh, fervor. You also have something which is known as installation art. In because art is growing, uh, what comes under the purview of art is gradually changing. Installation art is where what happens is that you install something in a place. So you put the things together in a place. And that is like 
uh, realizing or discovering that any place, uh, if it is uh, concentrated upon as an aesthetic space, can be actually transformed into an aesthetic space. A very common example, which we are hardly ever aware of, is Durga Mandaps, Durga Pujas. Durga Pujas are massive installations or small installations. You can have a small installation in your house that is both a sacred space as well as an aesthetic space. You want to make a sacred space beautiful. And that effort is what you see in many traditional installations of the Durga Puja. This is a modern installation. You can have a wide range of things. You can have multimedia installations where maybe sound is there, uh, videography is there, as well as certain objects. And these totally create a particular kind of uh, a multimodal aesthetic experience. Architecture, Professor Joyce's field, is also a field where objects which are created are also treated as objects of beauty. And one very well-known architect happens to be Charles Coria. And uh, as I, I'm uh, not the appropriate person to discuss him, but at some point of time, maybe Professor Sen can share a few slides about him. Coria happens to be very strongly influenced by many of the ancient Indian architectural traditions of the Vastu as well. So you find that revisiting old tradition and putting it in new forms uh, is something which you find again and again being done by many of the artists that we have run through until this point of time. Then, of course, we have what is known as craft. You have three examples of craft at the top. You have four examples of folk art at the bottom. These are also treated as art forms. So in, if you're looking at the modern day, modern time, then craft and art are not really differentiated. Even these objects are treated within the framework of art. But there is one distinctive dis difference. What is the difference? Please take note of it, that in case of all these uh, examples that I have shown you, there is the issue of an author. There is somebody who has done it, done it who is known to us. Here, this has been done by some human beings. We are, we are sure of that. But this artist is unknown to us. So there is a politics of power. We will talk about it at a later point of time. But this politics of power makes it uh, such that certain kinds of art are treated as high art, where authorship is given. If you sell, uh, resell, it is the name that sells and the folk art tradition, which, or even the, if you're looking at, uh, I mean, ancient uh, traditions, you have miniature arts and miniature art traditions, where the name of the artist in most cases is unknown to us. But this is also art because if you're looking at the broad concept of art, art is something which is which makes the space beautiful, or which is beautiful and makes us feel beautiful. Uh, Professor Sen talked a little earlier about the philosophical aspect of it. And we find that uh, this concept of beauty is something which starts with the ordinary objects or ordinary experiences and moves on as we go deeper into it, into the experience of something which is more profound, spiritual. And whichever form of art we are looking at, these are very much to be found there. The other thing that he pointed to is the integration of art and technology. Friends, at all points of time, art is dependent on technology because you see that art depends on the materials and the facilities and the technologies which are available. So as the technology around us changes, our art form also changes. I'm not going to be able to focus much on that in this session, but I would kind of, kind of summarize this part of the session by talking about materials and mediums. We have watercolor, oil, pencil, charcoal, mixed media, printmaking, encaustic, which uses uh, particular kinds of, uh, I would say, um, seals, uh, sealing material, uh, uh, wax-like material, okay? uh, tempera, fresco, pastels, oil pastels, oil that is known as crayons, screen printing, photography, architecture, sculpture, working with papers, working with Ikabana, flower arrangements, installation, digital art. And you see that when we are talking about installation and digital art, they very much depend on technology. And even immersive art, where interactive art, where the artist's artwork negotiates and interacts with the audience or the viewer who not only views it, but experiences in it, it in an immersive way. So you see that uh, I told you that I will be kind of uh, introducing you to different uh, art forms, 
introducing you in the process to different Indian artists as well. Uh, I'm also going to quickly introduce you to uh, different materials and mediums, which I've tried to do as quickly as possible. I'm also taking you through some very interesting questions. Uh, these may be linked to one another, but in a scattered way, but these are very interesting questions which came to my mind through my journey uh, of visual art for the last 40 years. And I'm sure comes to the art uh, minds of many young people who start exploring art uh, in some way or the other. What is this that created art? What is it that created art? How did it originate? Many of us feel that they originated probably from a deep driven aesthetic tendency of human beings to make or to represent something beautiful. Now, current contemporary brain studies do tell us that uh, the aesthetic intent or the desire for something beautiful is something which is universal. Recent papers that I've read indicate that the desire for what is beautiful is universal. However, what we consider beautiful can vary from person to person. There is no generalizability about that, but the desire to be, uh, to aspire for that which is beautiful is common to every human being across cultures, across traditions, across things. However, if you're looking at early art forms, if you're starting from Manjadaras to the cave paintings and all that, very often uh, anthropologists and uh, uh, historians tell us, uh, archeologists and historians tell us that they find it related to ritual function. Uh, some kind of ritual, some kind of magic, okay? And um, generally associated with religion. Because in those days, when resources had to be optimized, people would only do that which is essential. So they would do art only if it is essential for their life. If they believe that the sculpture of mother goddess is going to give them good crop, then only they will build a sculpture of mother goddess. Because they don't have energy, they don't have resources for playing around, exploring, experimenting the way we have. All their experiments have to be functional. So, so from ritual to function, and then as civilizations grow, as life becomes peaceful, as people have leisure, then we move in the direction of aesthetics. The other thing is that this is why from ritual to functions, specific functions to aesthetics, you see one movement. The other one is a very different movement where you start using objects of everyday life, starting from pencil, books, colors, doors, windows, houses, and then as you start using these everyday objects, mobiles, phones, uh, lights, computers, you just don't want to have them. You also want to have something which is beautiful. So that brings in the concept of design and aesthetics or art, because design is very much a significant part of art. Now, the thing is that, as I told you, I'm going to raise a few questions. I'm going to raise a few problems, uh, issues that might emerge. What is your art is not my art, and what is my art is not yours. This is the battle of cultures. You see that there is uh, something which, which I would call the Western controlling paradigm, which means that the West and the colonialization of the West dominated almost all the cultures, all the other cultures. And when you dominate a culture, you have a tendency to consider it as inferior. So as Professor Sen pointed out, uh, the Greek culture collapsed, the Indian culture did not. The point I would like to make here is that if you're looking at the Western tradition, they had a false sense of superiority. And even today, that plays a very important role. We might discuss at some point of time, starting from the institutions that we have to publication of papers where we are all controlled by Western paradigms. So the Western, even our art, uh, uh, let's say market, is to a very great extent controlled by Western paradigms because Indians can't afford to buy much art. So if you're if you're aspiring at some point of time, you're aspiring to sell in the West, although it doesn't happen too often. And uh, again, uh, the market is what, to a certain extent, drives what is popular in art at a particular point of time. But coming back to what I was talking about, you see that when the Westerns started looking at our art, they kind of looked down on our art. They said that these are not naturalistic, these are formal. Ours is naturalistic, dominance of illusions. We have, we can create an illusion of reality. So you see that this obsession of a Western obsession with illusions has brought us to a point where virtual reality is uh, reigning supreme in our lives, right? 
So this east-west divide is something which you find in art and is an interesting thing to explore, although to a very great extent it has also been reached. And the Western tendency of looking down at other art forms for a very long period of time is something which is significant if you're looking at the history and the configuration of art styles and forms, because the Indian artists started exploring, challenging the Western paradigm. So you find uh, that in Santini Ketan and in uh, Madras and in, uh, in the South, uh, during the early phase of uh, the 20th century pre-independent period, people started significantly exploring, exploring and challenging Western paradigms, started searching for their own roots in order to become visual artists. So the influences were very strongly, dominantly Indian influences. So for instance, in Abandhanindranath Tagore, uh, you and Andalal Bose, you find very strong Indian influences because they started searching uh, for the Oriental influence in China and uh, for Indian influence in tempera painting and traditional uh, folk paintings to start regenerating, uh, recreating an art and looking at an art which was very different from the Western way of looking at art. Here is a beautiful uh, book I would definitely recommend you to re read, which is known as My Name is Rose by Oran Pamuk, who recently got the Nobel Prize, uh, which deals with this conflict between the two different art forms, the Western paradigm of art and uh, the Istanbul uh, Oriental paradigm of art and the conflicts which emerged over that. Beautiful book, which deals with this debate of art. And it's a wonderful mystery thriller as well. Now, if you're looking at the historical overview, I was point out that in the moment you Google on Wikipedia, you will get a historical overview or uh, on any uh, uh, popular website, you will get a historical overview. And this is dominantly a Western historical overview. All historical overviews have a tendency of trying to find relationships and influences uh, in the particular art form. But we would need to look at the alternative histories, the Oriental art, the Indian art and its flow, the Chinese, Japanese art and their flow. So I'm sure that Sogata sir at some point of time would be addressing these issues. And if you look at your syllabus, you would be looking at this alternative history. You are not looking at the uh, Western paradigms, the Western history of art. You are going to look at the Indian history of art. And as uh, Professor Sen pointed out, it is the central ethos, the central idea, driving force for this center and for the a revival of the Renaissance that we are looking at in rethinking, reinventing, uh, reimagining, and rearticulating our ancient traditional knowledges in various ways. The other interesting, fascinating thing uh, about uh, art is art is all about visualization, visuality, and visualization. You see or you are seen. Okay, the art object is seen, and somebody sees the art object. Who sees whom, and what does it all mean, friends? Uh, uh, there is a very interesting concept known as the panopticon. I will not go into the concept. You can search and Google for it. But what I'll tell you is that you see that panopticon is the concept of somebody being invisible but being able to see. A person who is invisible and is able to see is a very, very powerful person. We have the example of uh, uh, a Jeevan's story, the invisible man who turns evil because he's, because he's evil, nobody can, uh, because he's invisible, nobody can see him. So he's all powerful, he can do anything without being watched. And uh, the panopticon highlights this concept that power stays in your own invisibility. So if you're looking at visual arts, visual culture, in today's politicized world, a uh, world where everybody watches everybody else, everybody captures everybody else on media, through CCTVs and all that, we live in a world where watching and watched is a kind of a very interesting game. The second interesting point I would like to bring in is the concept of the male gaze. If you're looking at the cinematic art form, which we have not touched upon here, but which is a very powerful visual medium, then it was at a point of time discovered that it is kind of biased towards the male gaze. If you're looking at popular Bollywood and Hollywood movies, you find that the woman is commodified. The woman is treated as an object. And the entire focus, if you're looking at the hero and the heroine, uh, until a very long point of time, is where the hero acts and the heroine is passive. The hero uh, is uh, dynamic and doing things. The heroine is receptive, accepting things. The hero uh, is the controlling agency. The heroine is the controlled agency. 
the viewer is generally considered as a male uh, male viewership which is objectifying the woman and looking at her as an object of beauty or whatever else so you see that the male gaze even in visual arts is a very very fascinating area i thought that i would like to share that with you and who is art made for the art and its audience a very very, very fascinating question see art is a subset of a production economy it's very much a part very much uh, uh, i would say uh, like shares and debentures because if you are looking at shares and debentures you see that they don't have any intrinsic value on their own a, a share of a company might go up just overnight without any change in value of production or anything else so you invest in a share today we live in a world where we invest in art in two different ways one is to beautify our space but the other one is to buy art objects so that i can sell them in the future at a better price so that is the market of art and visual artists aspire for a uh, kind of being a part of this art uh, market because it is in this market that they can survive so this is another very fascinating very very important aspect of art the entire mechanism of uh, the art space and the art economy space that i thought i should share with you for example you see that there is also this question of authority i talked a little earlier about it ravi verma's ma durga jamini roy's ma durga i'm sorry the y is missing here and a dokra work of ma durga you find that uh, you if you are intrigued and if you are searching you will be able to identify who are the authors of these two art forms but however much you might try you will never be able to find out the author of this particular durga which is which is equally beautiful because of this classification of art into art and craft into high art and low art into art which derives its value not from its intrinsic quality and material beauty but derives its value from who has made it pablo picasso scratches five lines and if i have that in with me tomorrow i can sell it for 5 crore rupees five scratches which has absolutely no value but so the the selling of this kind of art is based on the identity of the artist on the other hand if you are looking at his dokra art this dokra art will always sell for it is in its intrinsic value whereas the jamini roy will not sell a jamini roy copy will sell for its intrinsic value okay 500 rupees 1000 rupees but a jamini roy will sell for couple of lakhs or even a crore rupees so these differences are there now i have already shared with you the art craft debate but i will take it a little further i will so request you to use the chat box or even use your, not the chat box but the microphone and answer this question who created taj mahal does anybody know who created the taj mahal very quick response the, the first thing that comes to your mind yes please yes friends can you just quickly share with me very quickly friends who created taj mahal Come on, guys. You can use the chat box also. Please. With that, we will go forward. We'll just take five minutes more. Come on. Anybody here? History books tell us. Do we know anybody? Come on, guys. Anybody here? Yashika Agarwal, can you share your response, please? Who created the Taj Mahal? Sir Shaja. Okay, thank you very much. So we have a ready-made answer uh, always available to us. That's what I was just. I wanted to know the stock answer from you. So if you're looking at who created Taj Mahal, then you find that the ready-made answer that is available to us is Shaja. Did he design the Taj Mahal? No. Did it conceptualize how it would look? No. Did he actually cut the marble or even put the marble anywhere? No. did he in any way uh, do the frill work did he create the uh, landscape space to each of these questions the answer is a no and yet we ascribe the authorship of taj mahal to a particular individual so you see that art has a very very fascinating story because some art is anonymous some have art has authorship and sometimes there are some art where the ascribed authorship and the actual person who has created art are very very different people So there are very fascinating debates about who has created an art 
not only what art is, which is something which would be very interesting to look at. I'm not answering the questions, I'm raising these issues. The authorship story also has the concept of value. So here is something we see in the year 2010, uh, SH Raja's uh, abstract canvas, this canvas sold for 16.5 crore rupees. So it was only in the 2001 or two that for the first time Indian artists were able to sell paintings or uh, their artwork for more than one crore rupees. Before that, they had never been able to reach that. And then recently, just a few days back, Goitonde, uh, who is a Delhi artist, uh, his 1961 canvas sold for roughly 40 crore rupees. Okay. Now, there is this concept of authorship and value. Now, anybody other than Goitonde making that, that kind of a painting or looking at a similar looking painting, it would not fetch that kind of value. So once art is commodified, art is made into uh, a part of economics, something else comes in. It is no longer the intrinsic value of art that dictates it, but fashion, styles, popularities, like values of sayers that we were talking about a little earlier. The last couple of points that I would like to make is that digital art and transcending the crisis of replicability is a very fascinating area. What is it that makes art unique? If you ask this question, their answer lies in the fact that art is unique because it is, it cannot be repeated. Any work of art is unique because it has a specific individual identity, because it cannot be recreated again and again. Okay? Each piece of work by an artist is unique, and it is this uniqueness that gives value to a work of art. However, you find that when with the digital uh, uh, world coming into place where you see that uh, the virtual art did not really exist in a physical world, the question of replicability and authenticity created a lot of issues. Until in very recent times, especially during the lockdown, a new thing has come up, which is known as non-fungible token-based artwork, which is digital art, which is uh, registered, licensed somewhere, and you can actually purchase it. And uh, recently, you see that uh, a, 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 an artwork was purchased for 70, roughly $70 million very recently by uh, an European artist which is actually the everyday vignettes, everyday vignettes or photographs of an artist who has nonstop recorded his everyday life for 13 complete years. So you see that happening over here. So digital art and transcending the, the crisis of replicability was something which was brought in uh, by uh, in the 1940s by Walter Benjamin, the theorist who deals with art. And then you find that this crisis of replicability is today resolved because you have this concept of digitable, uh, non-fungible token. More important, recently the um, very well-known uh, robot, Sophia, you know, there is, there is a robot known as Sophia, Sophia I believe. And uh, I had the good fortune of seeing her in Dubai when I visited uh, that place in 2018. Sophia was there on display in their, um, um, their World uh, uh, Happiness uh, Program. This particular Sophia started painting and one of her paintings recently sold for a couple of crore rupees. So that again came under the category of non-fungible, but here interestingly, the authorship goes not to a human agent, but to a non-human digital agent. So this entire field is a very fascinating area. I'll try to close this session with just a few words, saying that I have a number of very interesting, yes, please. I have a... Okay, please. That's wonderful. So, uh, I'm, I will be wrapping up this session by just telling you that I have some favorite uh, painters. And if you're looking at their paintings, uh, these paintings, for instance, Amrita Sergal started looking at our folk tradition, folk art of the Himachal Pradesh. M.F. Hussain started working on many radically important Indian themes like Mahabharat, Sita, many of the uh, Indian mythological figures. You have Laxman Pai who worked with uh, the objects of nature, uh, basically the very interesting relationship between human beings and nature. You have uh, somebody like uh, Satish Gujral, who is a polyglot uh, working as an architect, uh, painter, sculptor, and a number of other areas, exploring uh, Indian idioms in various interesting ways. You have Sunil Das, uh, whose line work uh, is absolutely Fantastic. You have Jamini Roy who revisited 
especially Bengal traditional art form and recreated it in an entirely different way, brought it to the fore. So my question is that, well, friends, over a period of time, I have kind of uh, disengaged myself from visual arts of the West, although I'm very much in touch with them. And I've started engaging with, started exploring, examining, being influenced by Indian artists. So who is your favorite artist? I'm sure that some of you must be having some favorite Indian artists, but it is also possible that some of you don't have an Indian artist that you know of really. And probably during these sessions, you would get an idea and get an opportunity to discover your own Indian artists. So there is one po last point I would like to make, which is that please somebody or one or two people volunteer to create a web page on Wix, just a casual immediately create a web page and let us start working and each artwork, let us start posting good artwork, whichever, and it could be a later on, we can have an even collaborative artwork, which we will start posting in the space that we create. And as discussed at some point of time, take it forward uh, as uh, some kind of a showcasing and nobody better than Joyce are in taking the lead and taking it forward. So with these words, I would like to thank all of you for your kind patience for staying with us and thank you. If there are a few words, few final words, summing up words from either Professor Sen or from um, Professor Saugata Das, with that we will end this session. So maybe another one or two minutes, please. So uh, is there anybody? Joy, just a couple of yeah, words. Yeah, I think this is, yeah, is Shokuto here? And I think Shokuto should speak here. Yeah. Actually, he's trying to join. I don't... Okay, all right. Shokuto, Shokuto, welcome, Shokuto. Okay, I can just say a few words in the meantime, Shogoto can come. I think this presentation by Professor Patnaik was just not all embracing, but it was also very pragmatic. And it had all the features of materials, approaches, styles, patterns, various gharanas and schools, and the battle of cultures, which has been the characteristics of the last 200 or 300 years and possibly the wonderful days of cooperation and uh, syncretic platform, uh, which may emerge in the coming few centuries. I think towards that, this academy will play a huge role because the students of IIT Kharagpur are extremely talented and they come with a strong background of science and here they pick up technology. And once art gets combined with that, I think, uh, uh, they will have all the things on the table to really become uh, the carriers of creativity, the carriers of creative sciences. So I think this course is going to help you a lot to become a more creative person and become a more contributing person to the society. So I think with this wishful words, uh, uh, I, I welcome Professor Shobhata Dash and his team and uh, uh, which is uh, Pinakida and others to come. And I think the coming weeks and months will be extremely interesting and extremely exciting. And uh, what will be most important in this course is just not to discuss things, but actually perform and do things and show things, uh, you know, share tiles, share common websites, common blogs. I think these are some of the things uh, uh, which I think I, I can see some of my students here like Swatika and others. So we have been doing this in our history of architecture courses. So I, I'll request some of them, especially from architecture background, to sort of uh, uh, garner these processes and make this course truly a livable and a creative one. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Sen. Uh, I will just request Pinaki to make the announcement for the next class if uh, Professor Das is not available. And with that, to close this session. Thank yes, you, Professor yes. Sen, for your time. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Priyo. I mean, actually, it's not Professor Priyodashi Potnek, it's Priyoda. So we have ah. Priyoda, Pinakida, and Joyda. You know, so these are the three friends, and of course, Shogotoda. Because in a art school, which Pinakida will say, everything is very warm and organic. That is the foundation of an art school. Yeah. Thank you very much, Joy. So over to Pinaki for making the announcements and closing this session.
we have already shared the link with the students that uh, our next class which is practical class is going to take place at 2:30 today and it um, I, I think they should uh, keep uh, pencil and white paper that is enough for today's class and so sure this is trying to join i don't know the network problem could be there so and there is no issue so in the afternoon uh, they meet and pinaki i will try to join for a briefly at least for some time i uh, have the link with me so and uh, this today it is a joint class from the next class there will be two groups thank you very much thank you thank you joy thank you friends thank you. we meet again in the afternoon thank you yeah, yeah. thank you Can you just